Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Governor Doug Ducey delivers his first State of the State address. We'll have analysis of the speech from political consultants. Plus, we'll hear about an organization helping parents of murdered children. And learn how Super Bowl organizers are getting the Hispanic community involved in the big event. That's all coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Governor Doug Ducey gave his first State of the State address. The governor focused solving the state's budget shortfall and education funding. We'll hear from two political consultants in a moment, but first, here's some of what Governor Ducey had to say about the budget and education. To balance the books, we're going to institute a state government hiring freeze with protections for vital areas like public safety and child safely, safety. However, However, when it comes to bureaucracy, we're cutting back. The government can't take on any new expenses when we can't afford the ones we already have. Our budget does what budgets are supposed to do. It prioritizes vital commitments that Arizonans value the most. Public safety justice, classrooms, and aid to the needy and vulnerable. So here's the plan. Let's make open enrollment and parental choice a reality and not just a talking point. Let's open the doors and make those empty seats available to our best public schools by creating what I call the Arizona Public School Achievement District. We can give our state's best public schools Shortly after the governor's speech, legislative Democratic leaders gave their reaction. It was an interesting proposal, and I don't think that he has committed to actually bringing new money in. What I heard was that he's proposing shifting money, and shifting money from administration to the classrooms. Um, but I would argue that that's already been done, and there's very little in terms of revenue that can be shifted into the classrooms. At the end of the day, we need to pay the money that we owe. Um, and I did not hear anything in terms of a commitment to paying um, the 300 plus million dollars that we owe this year to the schools, but rather a commitment to, to fight in, in terms of the lawsuit. Joining me now to discuss the governor's State of the State address is Jaime Molera, partner with Molera Alvarez and Mario E. Diaz, president of Mario E. Diaz and Associates. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us on Horizonte. Uh, both of you have been in, in gubernatorial administrations. Uh, Jaime, you were with Governor Hull, and, and Mario, you were Governor Napolitano. So bring back any memories. How would you compare their first in our, uh, State of the State addresses with, with Governor Ducey's? Well, with Governor Hull, I, it, it, was, it was a lot of difference. Uh, governor Ducey was much more of the vision of what he wants to do as governor. I think Governor Hull, we kind of threw in everything but the kitchen sink, where, where we talked very specifically about programs, she recognized lawmakers that were running bills that were important to her, kind of an old school type uh, speech. Uh, but this was a lot different. Uh, he was, it was very brief. I was surprised about the brevity of it. And again, it was, it was a little bit of an expansion of his inaugural speech, but it was more on the vision of what he wants to accomplish as governor. And I take it in Governor Hull's case, that was kind of a reflection of the fact that she had been in the legislature for so right. many years, knew all those people out there, so she wanted to mention them. Exactly. She was a former Speaker of the House and felt like uh, a governor should really reach out to those individuals that are running legislation that's important to that administration. And so I, I think she mentioned out of the 90 members, probably 72. Yeah. <laughs> the other one she didn't like very much, so she left them out. <laughs> so, so Mario, uh, Governor Napolitano, her first state of the state, and, and Governor Ducey's, what do you think? Oh, lots of comparisons really? here, Jose. I think uh, people, so, the governor would be surprised. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right, but new energy. So Napolitano comes in, uh, new energy, Doug Ducey, new energy, a uh, sense of uh, a vision uh, that we have with this governor. Um, both talked about efficiency review. Uh, Janet Napolitano talked about efficiency review. Doug Ducey talks about an auditor. Janet Napolitano talked about increasing five cents of every dollar to, into the classroom. Doug Ducey talks about more money into the, into the classroom. Janet Napolitano talks about, I'm going to create a tax review committee. 
Uh, Ducey talks about uh, no more taxes. So a lot of parallelism here. Uh, I found it interesting. Though on taxes, wouldn't that be one difference? Uh, both are talking about reviewing them, but, but Governor Ducey really laid down a, 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 a marker, line in the yeah, sand and yeah. said there are not going to be any new taxes. And he also said he's not going to do anything to halt tax uh, cuts that are in the works. Uh, this is true. I mean, uh, Janet Napolitano's uh, vision with, with the committee was to look at every um, possible uh, deduction and where can we eliminate. Uh, and yeah, and Doug Ducey pretty much laid down the, the marker and said, uh, no, no taxes under my watch. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how wise is that given the fact that we are in pretty, um, maybe Better not first. desperate, but yeah. difficult financial circumstances? Well, remember, that was his mantra during the campaign. He, he also talked about eliminating the uh, income tax and scaling way back on the corporate income tax. So I didn't see that as a surprise. Um, I believe you know, one of the things that he's going to do, and Friday he releases a budget, it's going to be very um, conservative to the point where there's a lot of major areas in the budget that are going to get cut. There's concern from the universities that there's going to be um, significant cuts to their area. They're one of the few major budget units that are not protected by voter protections, like K-12 is, uh, like the Medicaid uh, because of Prop 204. So I think there's he's said it. Um, we're going to have a budget uh, that's going to lim live within our means. And so that's going to be um, one of the few, one of the first things that I think is going to be uh, interesting about how people react and how yeah. they deal with the criticism of those kinds of cuts. Well, we don't have any specifics, uh, Mario, but, but we do know that one of the things the governor is proposing is a hiring freeze. How effective could that be? Well, I don't know if we've even been hiring. Uh, so, <laughs> so I guess it's a hiring freeze uh, plus. <laughs> let, let me say this. I'm concerned about what, what Jaime said. Uh, you know, for the past uh, five years or so, universities' budgets have been slashed. You know, it's projected that by 2018, uh, two-thirds of the jobs are going to require some sort of higher education, be it community college, university. This is, this, is, this is a vision that I hope that Doug Ducey and his administration take a look at after we fix this budget because there, there's no way out of the budget for this year and for next year. We have to do what we're going to have to do. But continuing that process, there should be another process where we're thinking about the economy of our, our, of our state. What are we going to do to move this state forward, but in a real way, not just as someone said, uh, a museum of ideas, but a museum of innovation. And I think that's what Doug Ducey can bring to this, to this state. I, I have confidence in him, even though I'm on the other side of the, of the mm -hmm. political aisle. Um, one of the things he said, Jaime, in terms of, of how he will get the economy going, moving the state forward, deregulation, which is kind of a standard um, uh, argument, statement from, from Republican governors, mm -hmm. uh, what can actually be done there? Well, in a lot of ways, I think he always talked about um, as his models of the kind of governor that he thinks were effective, like Scott Walker out of Wisconsin or Mitch Daniels, former governor out of Indiana. They were very aggressive about privatizing a lot of functions within government, about uh, pension reform, of course, is a big issue. It's a hot topic um, in this state. That's something that, uh, because it failed in the city of Phoenix, tried to do a pension reform light system, and that still failed. Uh, I think you're going to see those kinds of proposals. I think you're going to see areas where uh, state government right now that might be uh, a lot of well, that might be ripe for reform. DES comes to mind. Um, there's a lot of folks that would like to see a lot of those functions maybe be privatized and, and maybe be done more efficiently. So I think it, those are the kinds of things you might be seeing out of this governor. So the other uh, major point of emphasis, Mario, was education. Um, the governor at one point, uh, in contrast perhaps to what may happen with higher education, said he's going to put more money into the classroom. Rebecca Rio says, well, he's just shifting dollars. He's not really generating more dollars. Yeah, well, look, the numbers are, are going to tell a story uh, today, uh, on, on Friday, uh, on, on where he's planning on shifting the money, because I think that's what he's, he's going to do. But let me go back to the vision thing. You know, there are probably pr individuals in prison right now uh, for mar mar marijuana use. You know, we have it, to a certain extent, legal in the state. You know, this is $23,000, if I'm not mistaken, uh, per year per prisoner. This is something that the senator, uh, the governor, uh, should be looking at, which is uh, reform in our justice system. There are issues um, like this, uh, as an example, 
that we should be looking at for years to come to try to save money so that we're not constantly going back to the chopping block for higher education or our public schools. So um, continuing on the, on the education theme, Jaime, the governor kind of opened that up by taking a shot at Common Core, what seemed to be a veiled shot there. And he talked about uh, the federal government and people on the other side of the state imposing their standards on us. Um, kind of continuing what I think most knowledgeable observers regard as a myth that this was forced on the states by by the federal government when it wasn't. Right. And was that just a political um, gimme to, to some of his more conservative supporters? Possibly, but at, but at the same time, his actions as governor to date, when you look at the people that he's brought in to help uh, with the transition, he brought in uh, Lisa Keegan, uh, who has been a very strong supporter, very vocal national supporter of standards and what happened with Common Core. Of course, she doesn't believe that the federal um, uh, ideas that follow a lot of times with these kinds of processes should come into Arizona, but she was a supporter nonetheless. Matt Ladner, who's very close with Jeb Bush, also a supporter of Common Core, was a co-chair of the transition. His um, uh, policy advisor he just hired, Don Wallace, um, very well regarded in the education community, a lot of gravitas. Uh, but really, th those are individuals that believe in high standards that we have to have a, a, an accountability system. Now, he might, his rhetoric might have been a little bit different, but the people that he's been working with and listening to, uh, I think, are along those lines. Sometimes I find it I ironic from my friends on the other side of the political aisle. So there's a complaint about the federal government mandating uh, a certain way to teach our children, yet his first action for the governor is to mandate a civics, well, actually to pass a, pass a bill at the legislature, <laughs> uh, to mandate a, a civics test for all seniors to pass before they graduate. I don't know the details, but uh, so there's, an, there's only a certain amount of time in the classroom uh, to teach uh, what we need to teach and now the governor is encouraging the legislature to pass and he'll probably sign uh, a new standard if you will for graduation. Well uh, Mario what about um, people on your side of the aisle, uh, Democrats, uh, many of the specifics in the governor's relatively short state of the state speech not something that would make them happy probably. Uh, at the same time, he began by reaching out. It sounded like a, a very conciliatory statement about taking a fresh look and there's no reason why we have to be enemies on, on everything. How do you think he's going to get along with the Democratic caucuses in the Senate and the House? I'm, I'm encouraged that the governor uh, will reach out to, uh, to Democrats, uh, both in the Senate and the House. Now the question is going to be, uh, are the leader, is the leadership going to want to, to, to play? Um, and to listen. I mean, they certainly don't want to be used by the governor and nothing occurs. But let me say this. I think that the Democrats, the House and the Senate, while, while they feel that they may be outside the process, can play a major role here for the future. They can call hearings on their own, informal hearings, and start talking about laying a plan for the next year and contributing in this way, as opposed to constantly, not this leadership, but prior leaderships, just being the party of no. That's how we become irrelevant. We have to have a certain sense of self-determination here and put plans forward. So uh, Jaime, last question to you, kind of on the same thing. What, what, what can we expect with this legislature and working with this governor? Well, Ma Mario's talking about the Democrats getting organized, and I think that's an oxymoron, Mario. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that I think there's going to be a lot of tension because remember the, the margins are still the same. You have 34-26 uh, in the House and you have 17-13 in the Senate. But you have enough Republicans on both sides that tend to be much more what, what would be called the, the middle, the moderates. Um, those folks are still there that could tip the balance. So by, if the Democrats um, do put forth you know, strong proposals and reach out to those Republicans, reach out to some of those folks in the business community that don't want things like university, massive university cuts. Then, then I think there's going to be uh, some interesting uh, discussions at the legislature. And it'll be interesting to see how the governor is able to maneuver that and, and bring those parties together. But I, I would agree the Democrats are not going to be um, uh, insignificant. They're going to have a big role. So, so we'll bring you both back to talk about that. Thank you so much for joining us this evening to talk about the governor's state of the state. There's a group helping parents cope with devastating loss. Producer Christina Estes tells us about this group and how they're helping families. On a sunny Saturday afternoon, 
a group gathers at Encanto Park in Phoenix. It's a group that doesn't want to see its numbers grow, but it does. Robert Carl Hernandez. I think there's 1,409 currently named. Including Becky Miller's child. I first got involved with Parents of Murdered Children about three months after my 18-year-old son Brian was robbed and shot to death in Phoenix in October of 1991. The local chapter of Parents of Murdered Children provided the understanding Becky couldn't find anywhere else. It's the most devastating event a parent or a loved one can go through. You can lose someone to illness and accident and it's still, it's still the most, it's still very difficult. But when it's cold-blooded murder, it adds another dimension that nobody is ever prepared for. I felt like I wanted the world to stop. I wanted to tell him, don't you guys understand? My son was murdered. Hey, time out. And everybody was going on with their lives. Maricela Carrion's life changed in September 2003. That's when her son Jesse, her nephew Timmy, and their friend Hector were killed. For me, I didn't work for nine months after that. I couldn't. And all I wanted to do was sleep. And I thought, if I could just sleep, and sleep long enough, then I don't have to feel this pain. The pain hasn't disappeared, but Maricela has learned to live with it, thanks to parents of murdered children. Still, there was something the group couldn't fix, the pain that consumed Jesse's older sister. We were best friends, and often people thought we were twins because we were so close. Years went by before Juliet used a Mother's Day card to express her sorrow. I said, hey, I am alive. I'm still here, and I very much need you. I need my mom. And it was like the light bulb went off for her. And I wanted to respect her time frame of grieving, and I didn't want it to sound selfish, but I did need her. And she apologized, and ever since that day, I feel that she lives her life for a purpose. I need this in order to make it through each day. Cherished photos and happy memories bring comfort, and so does little Jessie, the girl born three months after her father died. Split image of him. Her demeanor, her the way she acts, her she loves sports. She she's exactly like him. Exactly like him. If we don't remember, then how will we ever affect the change that it's going to take to stop the violence from happening in the first place? Back at Encanto Park, Becky Miller oversees a ceremony observing the National Day of Remembrance for murder victims. Jackie Vanessa Reese. Gary Lee Almond. Brianna Amelia Naylor. Jeffrey David Bellamere. Jessica Dion, Timmy Vallejo, and Hector Hernandez. Some might find it easier to flee the tears rather than keep facing them, but not Becky. I handle it because somebody was there for us when we needed them to hear. And so many of your family and friends, um, it's hard for them to hear about it. And they want their life to get back to normal and they want you to get back to normal. And yet that's not something you ever get to do. You actually have to rebuild. Or sometimes I say redesign your life while the redesign includes loss. It also includes the addition of an extended family. And while they never wanted to join this group, they are grateful to be part of it. In addition to monthly support groups and workshops, Parents of Murdered Children offer guidance for families navigating the criminal justice system. You can learn about the group at POMC.com. Arizona is less than three weeks away from hosting the Super Bowl. The Arizona Super Bowl host committee is also extending efforts to get the Hispanic community involved and excited about the big game. With me to talk about the specifics of what is being done is David Parca, board member with the Arizona Super Bowl 
host committee. And uh, David, I should mention that I serve with you on that committee. Yes. Um, uh, there is a lot that's being done with the Hispanic community in the United States and particularly in Arizona. But before we get to that, there's also some significant outreach to the country of Mexico. Talk about that. Yeah, it comes from the vision of our chairman, David Rousseau, who had the vision to include our number one trading partner uh, to the big party and really showcase what Arizona is all about on an everyday basis and showcase that strong partnership and strong relationship we have with Mexico. So what kind of presence is Mexico going to have at, in Super Bowl in Arizona? Uh, it's pretty significant. and came, It came after the effort that we did to uh, go down to different cities in Mexico throughout the last couple of years uh, and really pitching the opportunities that for the first time in Super Bowl history presented. And uh, that um, translated into having a full street of uh, our Fan Fest experience, which we call Verizon Super Bowl Central, uh, dedicated specifically to Mexico as a country to showcase uh, tourism and business in Mexico. So they've got a full block in what is, is the biggest Super Bowl central type area in Super Bowl history, 12 blocks, right, as compared to what, just a, a couple of blocks in New York City, for example? Correct. Uh, we are denom denominating that uh, Verizon Super Bowl Central, uh, and it's uh, 12 blocks of downtown Phoenix that are going to be close to traffic. Um, just a walking experience, different activations. Uh, in other Super Bowls, as you mentioned, it was one street. It was called Super Bowl Boulevard. Uh, but for us, it's 12 blocks all around downtown Phoenix. And a lot of activities. We want to talk about some of the things that are specifically targeted to the Hispanic community. But this has been going on, this outreach effort now for several months. We've got some uh, pictures of some of the graphics that have been used in tweets to, uh, to send a message to the Hispanic community in connection with some of the most significant holidays that the Hispanic community observes, a uh, uh, couple from Day of the Dead, Day of the Los Muertos, um, Super Bowl themed, and then, and then we've got a couple that we'll be putting up on the screen um, in connection with uh, the recently celebrated Three Kings. Um, um, so, so here's, here, in fact, here's the, the traditional Rosca Three Kings cake with a Super Bowl, with a football there. Um, I think we've got another one that's uh, an ornament. Well, that, that would be from Day of the Dead back in November. Uh, and a couple more that, that really show the uh, outreach effort by the committee to the Hispanic community. What kind of results are you having? Uh, we've been having tremendous results. Uh, again, we wanted uh, this Super Bowl to be inclusive. Uh, the Hispanic community in Arizona is over a third of our population and it definitely has to be part of our festivities. Um, because of that, we've made this type of outreach in our social media, uh, all of our Twitter feeds, uh, Facebook pages, web pages are all in English and in Spanish, which is also a Super Bowl first uh, to make uh, our community feel in inclusive within all those festivities. And we are going to have uh, a particular Hispanic day uh, within Verizon Super Bowl Central um, and with uh, acts that are free to the public uh, that are going to be performing that day uh, specifically targeted to our community. And that is the Thursday of Super Bowl week, right? Correct. And, and um, can you give us a sense just the caliber of, of, of the acts? These are big names that you're going to have there. Yeah, it's international talent uh, of first-class talent, um, which, which we'll be announcing in the next couple of days. Um, but it's all uh, family oriented. Uh, we're encouraging everybody to come down with their families, enjoy all the different activations from different uh, uh, vendors and suppliers that we're going to have in, in downtown Phoenix. And that includes the NFL experience. Uh, explain that. What's that all about? Yeah, the right, really, uh, downtown Phoenix is going to become the hub of Super Bowl. Uh, not only do we have Super Bowl Central, but we're going to have the media center at the convention center. We're going to have the NFL experience where um, people and, and uh, their kids will be able to uh, enjoy what it, what it takes to play in the NFL. Uh, meet some uh, players, NFL players, get some autographs, get their picture just taken with a Vince Lombardi trophy, do some drills, uh, a lot of fun for the family. And I know it's happened a few times before, but it's fairly unusual to have the Pro Bowl the week before the Super Bowl in the same city. Exactly. Normally it's played in Hawaii. Uh, this is only the third time in Super Bowl history uh, where it's going to be played in the same city. 
Uh, it's the Sunday before the Super Bowl, which is going to kick off all of our festivities, and we're really lucky to have the Pro Bowl. And it's a great opportunity for people to uh, go and watch a game uh, while it's here in town, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the big game. But I know from some of the discussion we had off camera that, that the results are encouraging. You're getting a lot of hits on the website and Twitter, twi Twitter responses. So congratulations to you and the committee and looking forward to a great and successful Super Bowl. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. And that is our show for tonight from all of us here at 8 in Horizonte. Thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.